Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe believe. this is the word of God. God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Do you believe that? You do believe that. That's good. That's good that you believe that. Because what you believe is what you act on. And uh, sometimes you act on things because you believe them, but you don't act like you believe them. You know what I'm talking about? If you really believe something, it's, it's deep inside. You know, if you really believe something, it's there. And I want to talk to you for just a little bit about what you believe and I want to ask you a question this morning. What are you worth? I mean, have you ever had somebody say, you worthless individual, you. But what are you worth? You know, the value of something, well, let me just talk to you about value for a moment. Now, this is quite heavy. This is 100 ounces of 99.9% pure Engelhart silver, serial number 096705. In 1974, this was probably worth a couple hundred dollars. In 1994, it was worth about $300. It varies in price, silver does. Um, Hmm. One time, <laughs> I had so many of these in Central Bank in their safety, po- safety deposit box that it pulled the safety deposit box out of the wall. <laughs> true, true story. And they had to divide up the silver that I had into several different safety deposit boxes. But this is just one bar. It, it's sometimes... Over the last few years, at one time, it was up around $4,000 just for this. I think right now it's around 2000 or somewhere thereabouts. But, um, so that's, what, that's the value we place on this, right? Okay. And uh, here's a can of tuna. $1.99 at the dollar store. There's a stamp. Could be valuable. Could be. I have something in my pocket here. That, oh, yeah. Here's a coin that was given to me by a dear friend. Great man of God. He's a minister, a reverend. He doesn't call himself reverend, but he is. He's, he's a licensed minister. Chris Stevens. Chris, are you here? He's over there. Okay, yeah. There he is, back there. This is precious. He gave this to me one day, and uh, it's, a, it's a coin that's from Christian Motorcycles Association, but it's a special coin. And when he, when he gave it to me, that really meant something to me. There's a lot of value in this. Yeah, there's value in that. And let's just say, for example, that you are on a boat... Let's say you're on a boat, and you're on a three-hour tour, <laughs> and, and somehow you end up on Gilligan's Island, okay? Um, and you've got these things with you when you come ashore, and you're hungry. And somebody's got a can of tuna. And you're hungry. Did I say you're hungry? As, as they say, you're hungry. And so you tell this guy who has the can of tuna that you've got a stamp that's probably worth five or six hundred dollars. 
And he says, well, that's just a used stamp. And besides that, there's no place to mail it. He said, it may be worth five or $600 to you, but it doesn't mean anything to me. To me, as far as I am concerned, it's worthless. And you say, well, wait, wait, wait just a moment. I've got, uh, I got some money here, you know, I got whatever, I got a couple hundred dollars. I'll, uh, I'll give you a couple hundred dollars for that can of tuna. I, I know that before we got on this boat, it only cost you $1.99. I'll give you $200 for it. And the guy says, well, what am I going to do with $200? There's no stores on this island. You know, maybe I could get Gilligan to cut a coconut for $200, but you know, it's worthless to me. I want your tuna. I want your, but I've got this coin. This, 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 I've, I've kept this in a precious place in my office, and I just brought it with me today on the boat. To me, this is like priceless. Well, it doesn't mean anything to me. I can't eat it. I can't, it won't keep me warm. Now, this is valuable. Real valuable. When we get back to shore, you could buy something with that. You could make a down payment on a car with that. Just, I don't know if we'll ever make it back to shore. Besides, if I'm going to swim, the last thing in the world I want to do is carry an anchor with me. <laughs> you know, that thing would just take me to the bottom. That's, to me, that's no more valuable than a rock. I really would like that can of tuna. So the guy says, okay, look. I've got two cans. I held one back. I'll sell you this can of tuna. So you get this can of tuna. <laughs> I'll tell you what really becomes valuable. A can opener. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what gets to be valuable. The guy on the island with a can opener is king. You know? You know, I used to have questions. I used to, I used to wonder why God allowed all of this pain and suffering to go on on the earth. People hurting. Entire nations starving to death because of a drought. Six million of his own chosen people got burned up in the Holocaust. Where was God? Doesn't he love us? See, if we could see the future the way God sees the future, because God doesn't see the future as future, he sees it as present tense because he's already there. You need to understand this. God doesn't know about the future because he's seen the future. He knows about the future because he's been there. He knows about the past because he's been there. And there's no limit to the future and there's no limit to the past. That's what we call eternity. God knows that those who love him and worship him, he knows that this group will be glorified like his son and we will worship him together throughout all eternity in glorified. He sees that. He doesn't see what you were as much as he sees what you will be. We live within the framework of time. So to us, our tomorrow hasn't gotten here yet. Our past is already gone. But to him, he is the great I am. He's not the I was or the I will be. He is the I am. And he created eternity. He created time. And he is above all of it. As I've shared before many times, we 
are kind of like the guy who pulled his car up to the intersection and a train's going by. And he's sitting there and, he, and just picture each one of those cars as, as a day or a year. And we're just there watching them go by. Just watching them go by. But God is, is kind of like the guy who's in the helicopter. And he's, he's up high enough that he sees the beginning of the train with the engine and he sees the end of the train with the caboose and he sees all the movement in between. He's seeing everything. It's the perspective. See, and we're limited to this time perspective. But God, he's seeing it all. He's seeing the engine and the caboose at the same time. Here's a clue. God knows more than us. But see... What are you worth? You, you may have been raised in a family where the old man said, you're worthless. You're a worthless piece of junk. You're, you can't do anything right. But in God's kingdom, you're valuable. See, the value of something is not related to necessarily earthly value. The value, the value of something is based upon its worth. Now, now, just think about this. On an island, the can opener is more valuable than the Engelhard silver. We look at it, see, this is, you know, the, the skit that the kids did earlier today. So many people are caught up in those various things, greed. You need to understand this. The richest man in the world and the poorest man in the world get buried in the same dirt side by side. And it doesn't matter how much you have, you don't leave with anything. All the material stuff is left behind. One minute after you're body dies. Of course, if you're a born-again believer, you continue to live. You move into the paradise of God. But one moment after your body dies, everything you've accumulated on this earth, everything, money, houses, boats, cars, airplanes, it doesn't matter what it is, everything you own one minute after you die belongs to somebody else. Regardless of whether you have a little bit or a lot. So what good does it do to build up your treasure here? Of course, you want to have a good lifestyle. You want to bless your kids. You, the Bible says a good father leaves an inheritance to his children. I mean, that, that's important. You want to bless the house of God. You can do good things with your money. That's true. But don't put all the value of life on the money. On things. See, God loves you. And that's the key. God loves you. And he has, here's, okay, the value of something is what you would give to get it. Let's put it that way. And what did God give to get you? See, that's the value he puts on you. What did he give to get you? He gave his only begotten son. He gave a part of himself to come to this earth as a child, son of God, son of man, put aside all of his son of Godship, take on the son of man. Jesus, look, when Jesus was a little boy and he fell and he... He cut his knee. His knee hurt and bled just like your knee hurts and bled because he came to earth as the Son of Man. When he died on the cross, yes, he was the Son of God, but he had all that set aside. He came to earth as a Son of Man. And when he died on the cross, he hurt and suffered and had pain just like everybody else who was being crucified that day. And what does he tell us to do? He puts all this value on us, and he, he loves us. I mean, we all know the Scripture, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Everlasting life where? With who? With him. He loves us that much. And what does he require of us? Well, Ephesians 5.1 says that he wants us to imitate him in the same way that children imitate their parents. It said, we should imitate God. Well, what did God do? He saw the value of everyone in this room, of everyone watching. He, he saw the value of you and me, and he gave his son for us. That's the value he places on us. Now, here's the thing. When you look at someone else, you need to realize that God put the same value on them as he put on you. So we got to quit looking at other people through the eyes of irritation and, oh, brother, and all that kind of stuff. We, we judge people by how much money they have, by how smart they are, by how athletic they are, by how handsome they are. <laughs> see, we, we judge people by all these standards, but God, see, man looks at the outside. God looks at the heart. God sees you for who you are, and when you receive Him, when you accept His love, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then He sees you for whose you are. Not just who you are, but whose you are. And you're in Him, and He's in you. And I tell you what, God loves you. But here's the key. When you look at somebody else, you've got to love them the same way God loves them. And that's what He requires of us. Listen, let me give you a scripture. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God, hmm. and knows God. He who does not love, next verse, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. I mean, God is love. He's the epitome of love. He, he loves you so much, he gave everything for you. So quit being snarky to your people around you that you see every day. I mean, do, do you want... You reflect God to the world. And if you are his, and he is yours, and you are in him, when you're snarky, that's the way people think God is. Sometimes, why, why, why do people think God is so mean? Because they've met some mean Christians. Huh. See, love, love can do a lot of things for you. And think of it this way. I heard someone say, love will do a lot for you if you'll just let it. Now think of it this way. Love will do a lot for you if you'll just let him. See, he is love. Wow. Now, keep in mind, when somebody's just born again, they have, they're not really all that mature, and it takes a while to get to be mature. But as we grow, we have the DNA of God inside of us. When we're born again, we have the DNA of God inside of us, and we need to grow in love. Now look, a lot of people think you need to know, grow in knowing the Scriptures. And some people think you need to grow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you need to grow in your giving. But let me tell you something. You can quote a lot of Scripture, and you can operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and you can feed the poor. But if you, if you don't do it with love, you're not doing it with God. You're doing it all on your own. I mean, the, the Scripture even tells us in Corinthians, we read this all the time, you know, it says, you can speak with the tongue of, tongues of men and of angels, but if you don't have love, you're nothing but just a, a clanging cymbal. Nothing's really going to work for you in your life until you kind of start acting like God. You start acting out of love. Hmm. Take a look at this scripture, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. 
But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all, what does this mean, above all? It's like the big deal, above all. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. I tell you what, if, if you love somebody, you, you will end up forgiving them. I have seen mothers love their children when their children were just brats. And when I saw their kid, the spirit of slap would come upon me. <laughs> you know, I just want to slap that kid three ways to Sunday. But the mother's over there cuddling. Why? Why? Because the mother sees something in that kid I'm not seeing. <laughs> you know? Jesus, when he was here, he was love manifest in the flesh. You know, what makes heaven heaven? Love. What makes hell hell? The absence of love. See, love is more than a lifestyle. It's God. You need a miracle in your life? Love will cause the miracles to flow. Do you have a family member or someone that you know that's not a Christian and you would like to get them saved? Well, the goodness of God is what brings people to the, to the Word. That what's, that's what brings them to the altar. Well, what is the goodness of God? That's God's love flowing through you. Hmm. You know, love is not just words, although it, words are good. They're necessary. But 1 John 3.18 says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in the truth. You've got to start acting a little more lovely. Of course, I'm not talking to you people. Yeah. <laughs> we need to start showing love. In John 13, 34, Jesus said that there was a new commandment that he was giving us. He said that you should love one another. How? He says, the same way that I've loved you. You ever stop to think that Jesus, Jesus knew that Judas was Judas? And he loved him? Hmm. How can we show love to the world until we figure out how to love each other? <laughs> you, you just can't talk bad about somebody all day long, and then when you see them in Walmart, just get sweet. Well, let's just say this. You can't love somebody and then think ugly things about them. The Bible says as a man thinks, that's the way he is. We've got to get rid of the stinking thinking. We've got, we got, we got to start loving people the way God loves people. Now, we can still correct people. We can still have correction. And we need to be able to take correction without getting all huffy. See, sometimes people will correct you because they love you. So don't take correction as something bad, you know? <laughs> oh. See, sometimes we, we pray to change people. We pray that people will change but then we talk about them the way they are. Hmm. See, Galatians 5, 6 tells us that our faith only works through love. If you eliminate love out of your life, you eliminate all the power of God out of your life. If something's not working, check your love walk. John 15, 12, Jesus said, This is my commandment that you love another that you love one another as I have loved you. Hmm. And there's so many scriptures on this. We could just, we could spend all day just talking about the love of God.
Mm. John 15, 19. I want to mention this. It says, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now you need to understand this. The world does not like you. The world hates you. But you cannot hate the world. Are you following me? You don't return hate for hate. Yes, you may have people flip you the bird as you're pulling out of your community going to church on Sunday morning. But how do you respond to that? With love. And how do you respond to them? Look, it's, it's kind of like the guy who went out and bought a used car. And it, he bought a used car. Actually, it was an old hippie van. And on the back of it, it had this sign that said, Honk if you love Jesus. Well, the guy wasn't a Christian that bought the, in fact, he was, you know, he was way far from being a Christian. And so a Christian pulls up behind and sees this little bumper sticker that says, Honk if you love Jesus. So he, dah, 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 and he pulls around and smiles real big, and the guy flips him the bird. <laughs> well, you know, you just got to understand the world doesn't like you, but you have to show love. That's not the time when you just drive, pull over, and, you know, get out and whoop him. Because uh, you just never know what. You know, I, I shouldn't tell this story because my mom watches my videos. But, and my dad's passed. He's in heaven right now. He's with the Lord. I mean, my dad's praising Jesus with Loretta's dad and mom and my son and many of your relatives and friends. They're all up there praising the Lord together. But I've got to tell this about my dad. My dad, we were driving down... He was going to show us where he worked, and he worked at the uh, Chevrolet plant in Kansas City. At, at uh, they called it Fisher Body, and he was in the paint department. And he painted, you know, your old 1956 Oldsmobile you used to own. My dad probably painted it, you know. So he was taking me and my mom and my little sister, me and my little sister. We were in the back seat, and he was taking us down Kansas City to show us where this big Chevrolet plant was. And there was a place where it was, it, the road narrowed down. There was, it was kind of like there was two lanes for just a little bit, but then it narrowed down into one lane. And so my dad's driving along, and this guy pulls up beside my dad, and he is in a 1955 mint green Ford. And um, it was a standard color back in the day. It wasn't mint green, it was kind of a, kind of looked a little bit like, dog bar for something. I don't know what it, it was. It was awful. But at any rate, this, this car pulls up beside us. And so my dad's going to look and my dad speeds up to kind of go around the car before it gets down to one lane. And this guy speeds up and this guy's over there making all kinds of motions, but my dad's not looking at him. My dad's boys. Well, no one's going to, this is my lane. You know what I mean? And so this car slows down. So my dad slows down. I mean, you know, he, he's not letting this guy get over. And so finally they reached a place where there was just one lane and this guy had no choice. He went across the other lane and went into the ditch on the other side. Ended up it was my mom's brother. <laughs> <laughs> and he had seen us and he was over there waving at us, you know. See, things aren't always the... I'm sorry, Mom. I had to, <laughs> Dad loves me, sorry. But here's the thing. Things may not always be going on in somebody else's life like you think. You know, there may be things happening around you and you're, you're thinking one thing and they're thinking something else. Come on, quit judging people and be like Jesus and love them. All right? Now, Hebrews 10, 24 says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Wow, that's good. And then I wrote this down. 
This is my conclusion of the morning. If you could realize the value that God has placed upon you, you would never be depressed. You'd never be in fear. Because you would know that the creator of the universe has a plan for your future. And he will keep his word and keep you safe in him. Your future is bright. And it all has to do with the love of God. The love of God. Can we receive the love of God? Well, certainly we can. Jesus has already paid the price. All we have to do is receive him. You know, the word of God says, uh, it, it's in Romans, and it says that if we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and if we believe that he's our Lord, if we make him our Lord, and we believe that Jesus came in the flesh and God raised him from the dead. We believe he resurrected. And we confess it according to the word of God, according to the Bible. At that point, when that happens, you have eternal life. Now, we call it being saved, being born again, becoming a Christian. All those terms are, are synonymous. But that's, that's what he wants for us. So I'm just going to ask you right now, to, if you believe this in your heart, I want you to make this confession with me. All right? Just say, I believe, I believe Jesus, Christ Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Son of God. I, believe I believe that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was, raised was raised from the dead by His Father. By his Father. I recognize and accept and proclaim that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. And I confess that I will never deny Him, deny my salvation. I am born again. Now here's the thing. I know most people in this room, probably most people watching, have already made that confession. They're already born again. But if you made that confession for the very first time today, and you meant it, and you believed it in your heart, then what happened is old things have passed away. All things have become new. You are now a new creation. You're a new creature. You're, you're a new species. You're a part of the church. You're a part of the body of Christ. And one question that I always get asked is, is simply this. Oh, come on. It can't be that easy, can it? Well, yes, it can. Because Jesus has paid the price in full. See, and many religions think and teach even, and you've got to be watchful of this, they teach that there's other things you have to do in order to have eternal life. There are certain things you have to sacrifice, certain things you have to say and do certain places you have to go you know it doesn't matter how many times you twirl the beads and all that kind of stuff jesus paid the price in full and if you think there's something else you've got to do in order to get saved what you're saying without realizing it is that jesus didn't pay all the price that there's something left to be done the bible tells us no he paid the price in full there is nothing left to be done other than us receiving it and if you made that confession and you believed it in your heart, you received it. Isn't that good? And it just takes us back to, the, to that it just takes us back to that scripture that we, we've learned as children, and we need to realize this is not just a catchy little verse out of the Bible, it's a reality. For God so loved say this, for God so loved me, that He sent His only begotten Son. That if I would believe in him, I would not perish, but I would have eternal life. And if you believe, that's what you have. Hallelujah. God bless you. God is good. Stand up, everyone. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We are so thankful.
that you could see something in us that we weren't able to see. You saw the value in us. We know we don't deserve it, but we receive your love. And we give our love to you. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, we love you. Amen.